Uh, Mr. Jaishankar, thank you. I've really been looking forward to this. And a uh, great uh, fan of your style, the way you speak, the way your, uh, you know, your forthright nature and your vocabulary and your Coming style. Coming from you, Arnab, that's a high compliment. No, no, I'm, I want to get, get rid of the fanboy part first. <laughs> but I must say that uh, we've been following everything that you've done for the country. And I have looked forward to this interview. So thank you. Thank you, Mr. Pleasure. Good to be here. Thank, thank you, sir. So we are in the middle of a general election, and uh, I want to address as many news points as possible in the course of this interview. Uh, broad question, uh, how comfortable are you in the middle of an election season? We've seen you going out a lot mm -hmm. of late, speaking to people, select mm -hmm. groups. Mm -hmm. uh, you, were, you were there at the signing of papers of some of our uh, uh, yes, candidates of the BJP. To, yes. But are you really comfortable with politics, like rough and tumble of it? Uh, I am, uh, I think it's a transition, it's, yes. it's a journey. Now, five years is a long time. Okay, so if you'd asked me this question 2019, maybe 2020, but uh, these five years have been very intense. Uh, you know, uh, in a way, COVID was, was a uh, period of, uh, and not just enormous responsibility, but a time when all of us at ministers went out among mm -hmm. people, you know, uh, tried to, uh, actually uh, motivate people to mm. support people so I think what's happened in these five years a combination of experiences challenges time and and frankly uh, the cabinet uh, colleagues around me from whom uh, you know often you learn by just mm -hmm. working alongside uh, I think the combination of all of this I think by now I've reached a reasonable level of comfort. I'm sure with seasoned diplomat you manage the political issues well, but at the time of joining the BJP and later after that, uh, was it ever a thought that joining politics is going to come in the way of your own views perhaps, you know, because you're not a career politician. I mean, did you, did, did you feel, oh, you'll have to compromise or change your line on some issues? Or come into agreement with something the BJP thinks for you personally may not be against as, in, as a lateral entrant, and you're much more than a lateral entrant, is that a... No. Is that a, at the back of your mind somewhere? No, I, I, I wouldn't say that because, you know, uh, mine was a peculiar case. Okay. Yes. Uh, I became a minister when I was not a member of parliament. Yeah. And more important, when I was not a member of a political party. Mm. Okay. So on the day I was sworn in as a minister, I was not a member of the BJP. Mm. Okay. And I must say uh, uh, it was uh, not that anybody... Uh, pressed me uh, to become a member. They gave me my space, they gave me my time. Uh, so, in fact, uh, I think I had quite a few weeks to think it over. Uh, and uh, for me, the occasion was I was uh, preparing to file my own nomination papers to Raj Sabha in Gujarat. Mm -hmm. I could have filed it as an independent. Why didn't, you? Why didn't you? Because I felt one uh, comfortable uh, in the BJP. Mm. I felt uh, I'd had a chance to uh, to talk to, obviously, not just Prime Minister, but other colleagues uh, as well. Uh, and I felt, you know, if you are a part of a team, uh, you need to be a, a full uh, member, uh, you know, someone who's, uh, who's getting into it uh, wholeheartedly. So I gave it. It's not that I didn't think about it. Mm. I reflected uh, a lot, and, and frankly, it was one of those... Uh, situations where I was debating with myself. I mean, yeah. it was not an issue I could share with anybody else. Yeah. But I took a few weeks, and because I, find, I found that on a whole lot of issues, what the BJP felt, uh, what the BJP was doing, uh, was very much aligned with what would have been my own view, what was yeah. my own view. And some of it I also, you know, I'm a political scientist by academic training. Yeah. Uh, yeah, diplomats, anyway, are very, uh, very uh, sort of avid observers of politics, including their own country's politics. So I was, I was quite familiar with with many aspects uh, of the BJP's uh, thinking. You know, uh, in our own uh, history, uh, BJP was a was a party which espoused exercising the nuclear option very, very clearly, very early on. BJP was a party which felt that on Pakistan, on terrorism on POK, we should take a strong stand. BJP was a party which had a very clear view on Article 370, something which resonated with me for many, many years, I mean, well before it became an issue uh, uh, in 2019. Or BJP had a 
uh, a certain view on, on China. Uh, BJP had a view on the United States. BJP had a view on Israel. So look at it from my perspective. You know, uh, someone coming in who looks at the political options out there. I mean, for me, uh, the BJP positions on this set of issues very much tallied with my own thinking. Yeah, I, 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 I get what, what you're saying, that broadly you're in the same line, and I agree with your assessment that the, the center, center-right center approach that the BJP has had on sure. issues is more or less in line sure. with your own worldview, and it comes across. Let sure. me also say this, yeah. Mr. Jayashankar, anyone watching you closely sees that there's a fair level of authenticity with what you're mm -hmm. speaking. It's not a put-on. Sure. But I have, I have, I'm, I'm looking at it from that perspective. The Kachatibu issue will be seen to be one issue mm -hmm. in which the politics got ahead of the foreign policy. So when the prime minister says that the, that the previous government callously, Congress government callously gave away Kachatibu, and uh, then the follow-up question to that will be that when the third term of the Modi government starts, are you not going to take that through as a follow-through action, or will you only say that they gave it away, but because it becomes obligatory then for you to reopen no. the, re the dialogue on Kachatibu no. with the Sri Lankan no. government, which no. will be a very tricky uh, no, issue. No, I, I think the point is something else. Here we have had, uh, for the last many decades, uh, challenges, problems faced by Indian fishermen. Okay? Now you had the DMK, posing as the champion of Tamil fishermen, saying they are in difficulties today because the central government took decisions which has put them uh, at, a, at a disadvantage or in difficulties. Okay. So a very clever political narrative has been constructed over many, many years where the DMK is uh, sort of fighting for the, uh, for the people who... Uh, who have a grievance, and it looks as though the center is the culpable party. Now, what the record actually showed was DMK was very much uh, party to uh, to the, the uh, to the decisions. Okay, and so uh, considering how much of an issue they had made this, you know, made it in parliament, made it a consultative committee, took it up in politics. You saw Anna Malay's interview, you know, how much yeah, yeah. Uh, Chief Minister was raising it. Chief Minister Stalin has himself written to me 21 times. 21 times raising issues of Tamil fishermen. So I think it was time that the public learned, saying, okay, this yes, we all recognize as a problem. Now let's be honest. Who's responsible for it? Who was culpable? Who did it? And who went along with it? Agreed. And, and the real issue is, Beginning from day one, they had mastered this practice of saying something in parliament <laughs> and saying that's something. A, that's the politicians are good at. Eh? No, 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 no. But this but, kind, but I, I, okay, this kind I, of politics may, may, should may, not may, be encouraged. May, may I intervene? Yeah, sure, please. Sorry, sorry to interrupt. I saw the papers and personally I was appalled. I also saw the entire interaction that was going on. Uh, I don't know the exact date, between the then Foreign Secretary giving a briefing to Mr. Karunanidhi, I think it's 1974, yes, on what happens, and he's laid it out, that this is the view of the central government, there could be Chinese influence, uh, we need to have a good relationship, and hence we are taking this decision, to which Mr. Karunanidhi responds by saying, that is there any other way, but finally gets convinced, and then says, effectively, that... Uh, I'll go along with you, but I'll have to take a slightly low-key angle on this or a different angle in the in local politics. Because which, I have to help you manage it. Because I have to help you manage it. So, <laughs> so it's, it's, it's crazy that between the center and the state then, DMK and Congress, they've come to an arrangement on the whole issue. You look, now, look, now. Now. Okay, you can say that is politics. My point is, having done that, now you are posing before the public and before the rest of the country as though you have nothing to do with it. That's, see, this is the core uh, point. I, I am again so with it. In, in, this is at a time when, after all, what, what is an election about? An election is about different political parties True. going to the people, saying, look, uh, this is what we believe, <coughs> this is what we stand yeah. for, uh, and we ask you for your trust and your support on that basis. Yeah. So we think that it's very important that parties should come clean. If they I don't am, come I clean, history totally, will come clean. I, I am totally with you yeah. on this. Totally, and I agree with you on this. Now, the question I'm seeing is that it's already, if anybody says it, it's already if Anamalai says it. 
The Prime Minister of India says it. Uh, a follow-up statement is made by the Foreign Minister of India. Then the Sri Lankan Foreign Ministry responds, saying this issue is resolved 50 years back. My specific question to you, sir, is can we now, re we realize the issue of accountability, hypocrisy, giving it away, duplicity of DMK, Congress, etc., understood. Can it really be opened up now? Can the Modi 3.0 government no, no, look, reopen look, the dialogue no. on, uh, can we make a claim on it? Uh, would that not worsen I, our relationship? I, I, Which, no, where do I, we stand on that? I, I think right now the important issue when people are going to polls is which party was honest, which party is not. Which party is responsible for the situation in which the fishermen are fi finding themselves. And which party, by the way, has been trying to uh, help. I mean, because I've also seen in this 10 years, both as foreign secretary and as minister, Prime Minister has himself repeatedly taken up the fishermen's issue with successive presidents and prime ministers of Sri Lanka. Yes. So right now, let's, you know, not jump the gun. L right now, we are dealing with an issue. Question number two is CA. And, uh, you know, I am, uh, I, I really felt very strongly about the way there were attempts to polarize the Muslim population or during the Shaheen Bagh event and, uh, you know, uh, 2000. I think it was 2019-20 period in the intervening winter. It was terrible. I mean, we, we took a very strong line on it as a channel. Uh, we, in fact, support it. But I am curious to know, I'm going back to Sri Lanka again, that during the Sri Lankan Civil War, there were some 10,000 army troops. We sent our army there to help, uh, you know, solve the situation there. There are between anywhere 4 to 6 percent of Indian Tamils in Sri Lanka as per varied estimates. There is a population there. There is an agreement which has been signed between India and Sri Lanka. We have promised to repatriate Sri Lankans. A lot of it has not happened. Long and short, my question is that why would, you know, why would the CA really logically not apply to the Tamil population in Sri Lanka? Because you will say there is already a treaty for Tamil repatriation, but then the same applies for everyone who does not come under the persecuted minority category. In the case of Tamils in Sri Lanka, and that's a long question, but I'm, in the case of Tamils in Sri Lanka, the primary filter of persecution, persecution is established. And if CA is about persecution, then why do the Tamils of Sri Lanka no, not no. come under the ambit? No, I, I think you are completely mixing up apples and oranges here. Uh, look, the CAA is derived from a certain period and a certain set of decisions in our history, directly from the partition. It deals with the aftermath of the partition. Okay. What happened uh, in the aftermath of the partition was that uh, different post-partition states yes. were left with, uh, with minorities, mm. and it was the obligation of the states to look after the minorities, okay. And that was the basis for the Nehru Liaquat Pact. When the Nehru Liaquat Pact was being concluded, in fact, there were wiser voices, saner voices, uh, which counseled, saying, look, you are trusting a Pakistani government which yes. already has a certain mindset, a certain ideology, a certain attitude uh, to behave like you are behaving. And they will not do that. Okay. That, and, and this is something which was very, very uh, sharply, repeatedly, specifically, particularly Shama Prasad Mukherjee, I think, was, was a, mm. a proponent of the view. But he was not the only one. A lot mm. of others held that view. What we have seen after that has been actually uh, a treatment of minorities which caused them to look for safety elsewhere. Now, in many cases, if you look at the minorities concerned, where else will they go but go to India? Okay. So, that was the logic of the CA. The Sri Lankan situation is very different because in the case of the Sri Lankan situation, the issue pertained to the, what were called the Indian origin Tamils. Mm -hmm. And those were negotiated uh, and uh, uh, settled through negotiations. So, I think you cannot compare what was happening in Sri Lanka with what was happening with Pakistan. I think they are totally different uh, situations. We are, through CAA, we are trying to do justice to a set of people who, in a sense, were caught on the wrong side of history, who were let down by the assumptions of the then rulers of India, 
that they will be looked after in the place Could of the Tamil. Could the to the Tamil Hindus that they were left no, on the no, wrong side no, of No, no, again, no. I think the, this analogy, I, I think, is not just. But is, it, is there also not an assumption here that India is the natural home for Hindus? That is the argument that the BJP puts when we, when CA, see, see well, okay, so Mr. Jayashankar, let, let me just give me a moment on this. The position technically as government and foreign policy is one thing. But the position politically is that India is the natural home for Hindus and the BJP has made India the natural home for Hindus. Now, Maldives today, we all know the Islamist forces. I'm not talking Islamist politics which is going on there. It's a Muslim majority country with some 99.6% Muslims. But there is a 0.3%, 0.4% of Hindus. So if the question is that India is a natural home for Hindus, then should that, should, should, should that lever not be open for us that if Hindus were to be persecuted and the politics were to be sharper in Maldives, we should bring them back equally, equally, allow me to complete. We do hear of persecution and torture of uh, Tamil Hindus. This has been a persistent political issue, so why should they be excluded from the process? No. Why should partition define our present day politics? No, look, partition does define our present day politics because it was such a fundamental, uh, you can say, mistake and whose consequences are still being felt today. So let us not uh, wish away partition as just another event in our history. It has had consequences. Those consequences today still continue to shape the politics and the foreign policy and the strategy uh, of the entire Indian subcontinent. So, so let's rec you know, keep the centrality of partition very much uh, in view. Again, I put it to you, I do not agree with the implicit uh, suggestion mm, that no, somewhere you are you know, uh, drawing an analogy between the situation in, uh, in Pakistan and the situation in Sri Lanka. In the case of Sri Lanka, and on the contrary, it is our position that the Tamil minority in Sri Lanka should be uh, assured a life of dignity, or li you know, that they should be given equal rights. So on the contrary, it is not that we are encouraging Tamils in Sri Lanka to come to India. That has never been the policy, uh, nor in my mind would that be the right policy. So I, I do not accept the, the framework in which you are asking that question. Um, Mr. Jashankar, are we being pushed by the West? I mean, I've been, I want to come to this trend of late. <clears throat> and, uh, you know, I've been noting the events, this trend of late of the West, really sharply, especially since January, February, and increasingly now with infrequency. 27th March, the United States State Department made a very, very specific comment on the internal matters of India, mentioned the arrest of Mr. Arvind Kejriwal, then went on to specifically talk about the income tax action on the Congress party. I saw it and I saw, felt the question was planted. I did a debate on it that night. And I also surmised that the answer was also rehearsed. Planted question, rehearsed answer. Mm -hmm. So my assumption is, and I said on that that night, America is deliberately doing this. They are pressurizing us. Then there was a comment by Germany, then there was a slightly more sedate answer by the United Nations. So the West seems to have a very enthusiastic interest of late, Mr. Jaishankar, on the domestic politics, especially before the elections. And uh, we've seen this, some Australian channel running stories on the Indian Prime Minister accused of stifling dissent. Germany makes two statements regarding Kejriwal's arrest. Then the U.S. makes two statements, deep concern over Kejriwal's arrest, freezing of bank accounts of the Congress party. You are summoning the ambassadors, they are going back but no reparative action and to top it all to top it all the un secretary the un uh, office also made the comment so my question is mr jay shankar why is i mean i won't get into why this perception is there about india because it's not perception is it the deep state getting back at india especially because they are seeing narendra modi come in for a third term they want to apply the pressure, uh, and they're not being very friendly about it. And uh, is it the deep state getting by? Is this orchestrated? It can't be one-off. It has to be within nations, five eyes, or something more deep than uh, what we, what, uh -huh. it's, it's not accidental. I mean, it, uh, doesn't, it doesn't appear accidental. Sure. I'm sure not to you either. Please. Look, uh, I would uh, use a different construct. Sure. Uh, uh, the construct I would use is uh, we live in an era of globalized ideologies. Okay. So what happens is people who espouse a certain line of thinking, let us say in India, hmm. 
would have counterparts or mirror images in other parts of the world. And in today's politics all over the world, uh, these similar thinking people, you can say fellow travelers, support each other. Okay. When one is down, uh, uh, the other tries to, tries to help out politically. Okay. This, is, this is, by the way, not necessarily with specific reference to uh, those uh, foreign ministry uh, remarks. I'm making it as a general point. So you see, for example, newspapers, TV channels, social media, reports, you know, ratings of various kinds. What, what is this entire phenomenon? This entire phenomenon is actually a globalized elite, you can say, who share a broad uh, similarity, who have also that sense of entitlement that they run the world. Uh, and if any part of the world goes off in a different direction and their preferred choices uh, are not doing well, mm. then they try from outside to influence, to legitimize, delegitimize, pressurize. This, this is broadly the Par for the course, you say? Uh, the, no, this no. is the reality. It's not par for the it's course. It's not. Because okay. I'm going to challenge you. Okay, okay, okay. okay. Uh, the, uh, the, uh, how, do you, how does one react to it? Okay. Mm. You react to it at a political level by countering it, by challenging it, by putting alternative narratives in place, by not turning the other cheek here, hmm. not saying, okay, it's one very prestigious newspaper in America, so therefore, you know, I must uh, uh, accept it or bend to it or... Hmm. Uh, so, if, if it, you know, uh, and, and particularly, you know, we've seen this, a lot of it out of New York and London. I mean, these are traditional Anglosphere uh, hmm. uh, sort of hubs, you hmm. can say. So I think politically this needs to be countered. Alternative narratives need to be out there. It has to be uh, clearly put that the kind of vote bank politics that they espouse, the kind of special interest that they advance, hmm. the fact that they, they actually uh, on the ground, you know, while, while preaching <coughs> a certain... Uh, 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 I would say uh, a vision of progress. Hmm. The reality is if you look at even the globalization vision that they espouse, a narrow segment of people benefit and actually large masses get left out, which is why there is today a global reaction to it. And by the way, we are today confident enough, strong enough and independent-minded enough that we will not be swayed by what you are saying. So we it will, won't matter to us. We will do our own thing. Uh, and we will counter it by our actions. So will the pressure work? So Will uh, the pressure work? So my first answer is, my way of responding to 10 years of pressure, one is by answering back, but yes. the other is by doing things in India. That when you have a government which says, look, this is a democracy that delivers, we will use technology, we will do good governance, we will ensure that social, socio-economic benefits will be delivered on a mass scale, and this will expose the people who espoused an earlier model, which was actually, I, uh, this is one way of doing it. Yes. The other is when it comes to foreign offices. Mm. Okay. In diplomacy, there is an etiquette. Okay. Um, mm. People have manners, nations should also have manners. Uh, sometimes people's manners are not good enough. I'm afraid occasionally that is the case of nations too. So when People with good manners, countries with good manners, are not expected to, to, uh, to comment on the internal politics of others. Because once you start doing it, then what happens is you open it up. You know, uh, now, this is not going to uh, help anybody at all. So the point here is to tell such countries that, look, it's in your own interest. Please don't go down this path. Uh, that uh, and. Uh, also, when they do it, again, don't turn the other cheek. That to, uh, talk to, I mean, as I tell people, look, if you comment on me, mm. I have the right to comment on your comment. Okay. Yeah. Now, how I modulate it will depend on my strategy, my interest, my timing. So, so this is not an era anymore because, again, part of it is it's not a level playing field. Okay. Mm. The people commenting and the subjects of their comment were historically, or at least in recent history, not on par. So some countries believe that over many years they've commented on the entire world and that gives them a continuing right to comment. The world is changing. 
You're going to get pushbacks. We are pushing back. Did America cross the line with the Kejriwal comment? No, I, I, the, I, I think uh, Anup, we made as, as straightforwardly no, as you can. No, I, I think we made very clear what our view was. That uh, you know, I'm we asking take, you, did they cross no, the line? I'm, I'm saying we took very strong objection to what they did. But it's different when an NGO says that. It's different when a, when a, when a, but it is very different when a government says it. Why the government saying? Well, look, we wouldn't take notice in the media if it was an NGO or a, or a think tank saying it, but if it's the government which says it, it's a completely different matter. Which is why, which is why we communicated very clearly to the American acting ambassador that we take a strong objection to what was said and that what was happening in India was not a concern of any foreign government. And that people should not... Why did they continue uh, then? Why did they persistently continue to make I'm, the comments? Did I'm, we... not, uh, I'm not... I cannot uh, either dissect it or justify it or analyze it beyond a point. I mean, if I feel what you have done is not correct, why am I going into what could be your possible mindset? That's for you to worry about. So, uh, part of last part of my question was that it's all happening together. Is it accidental that four or five governments are all saying the kind of same thing it's, no. it's, and it's official. It's not coming from UN, Germany, uh, America. You know, I, I, I don't, is it accidental or I is it coordinated? I don't have a conspiracy view of the world, but I do have a view that different uh, uh, countries, different political interests, different governments sometimes coordinate. Uh, that is a fact. Will it affect the foreign policy of Modi 3.0? I don't think so. No. I don't, I don't think, think so, or it won't. No, it? no, absolutely. If all these countries were to put pressure, look, would it affect look, our domestic no, politics look, or our... Would, would what, we, what do you mean they're going to put pressure? I mean, is that going to make a difference to our election results? It won't. I mean, do you think anybody in this country wants to be told by some foreign government as to what is right and what is wrong? And if you look at these issues, here is a bottom line. You know, there is a process of, you know, there are legal issues, okay. okay. In these countries, does the law stop when election starts? So, so do they expect the law to stop in India? Yeah. So, look, I, I think let's not uh, overdo this. I mean, fine, they said something, we answered them back. Uh, we've been very clear. I mean, nobody faults us for lack of clarity. That much I can assure you. And I think... Uh, that's where it says. Now, if they, if in their wisdom they choose to say something, then in my wisdom I will also answer. Yeah, and and what you say is very assuring, very reassuring for a lot of our viewers. Uh, but Mr. Jayashankar, the way we are placed as a country, as a as a global player, hmm? things are going to dynamically change. The Prime Minister speaks about Vixit Bharat, and there's a genuine sense of excitement about it. And I must say this. Uh, that, that the way the, the, the government handled Ukraine was just, I mean, I've said it once he, the Prime Minister was at our event, and I said that history will remember the way we did it. But, uh, you know, the world will not want us to balance different boats. And your answer to that, maybe we are not balancing boats, we are in our own boat. But, but I, if I may go into a detail on this, the messaging of in the Ukraine Foreign Minister's holy video, uh, announcing his visit to India was not lost on anyone, you know, standing in front of the Gandhi statue, speaking at length on the values of Gandhi, making a very subtle nudge on the moral, uh, you know, the moral need for India to support uh, Ukraine in the war against Russia, similar to the headlines uh, being made about India abstaining to vote on the Gaza ceasefire uh, a few days ago. Uh, so there are undoubtedly lobbies and uh, lobbies putting pressure on India to take a stand. Uh, is it going to become increasingly difficult? Question one. Question two, as we become more significant, we become a $30 trillion economy by 2047, it's a reality that coercion tactics, pressure tactics, you know, all these things will increase on the country. For people who are watching this interview in the context of the general election, uh, they would want to know whether you, whether you feel these pressures will increase in the future and therefore whether you feel whichever government comes into being or is in India over the next 5, 10, 15, 20 years. We'll have to take a little bit of a continuity route on our foreign policy. Uh, you know, uh, we all like to say this, that foreign policy has a, is largely an exercise of continuity. Like anything, 
in yes. life, it's partly true and partly not. Mm. Uh, I can give you examples of continuity. I can give you examples of of sharp of differences. Sometimes sharp differences. I think today, if one looks at uh, our relationship with the U.S. or uh, our response to China, handling of Pakistan, uh, stance on West Asia, yeah. uh, Israel, I would argue that a lot of these would have been different had. Uh, a BJP Sarkar under Narendra Modi not being in power. Okay. Uh, but having said that, your question, uh, so, so it does matter. It's mm. not like foreign policy runs on autopilot. It doesn't matter what government comes. I think it matters very much course, what government comes. I mean, this government, for example, has a, uh, has a very uh, robust policy on counterterrorism. It has a a strong policy on defending our borders. It has a view about standing up to pressure. You yes. mentioned Ukraine. I yes. could give you Quad as another example, the pressure not to go ahead with Quad. So it does matter very much who is in power, who is the prime minister, what is the vision, what is the level of confidence. These things do matter. Your question, uh, will the pressures increase as we become bigger? Yes. Uh, you know, it's natural as any country rises, particularly a big country rises, uh, so, that uh, there will be others who will, in a sense, uh, uh, some will look askan, some would be uncomfortable, some would downright oppose. We are seeing shades, of course, uh, shades of it. Uh, so a lot of diplomacy is going to be about how to manage that rise in the most smooth way possible. Now, if you look at China's rise, China essentially rose, I would say, between about 1990s mm. till the early 2010s, the 20 years. Those 20 years, China had great stability in the international environment. You know, there were things happening, but those things were firewalled and put away on, a, on the side. It didn't affect mm. China. In our case, we have to be prepared to rise amidst a very volatile global situation, a lot of uncertainties, you know, the, where U.S. will go, where China would go, what will happen with Russia, is your, Europe becoming more strategic, will the Middle East uh, kind of uh, explode even more? These are all going to be big issues. So we are actually looking at two, at a very interesting proposition. On the one hand, there is the rise of India. We have, you know, put our house in order we are preparing ourselves for a, for a big move. Uh, on the other hand, when you look, there are headwinds. We have to have the experience, the confidence, the wisdom, the understanding to, to navigate uh, through those headwinds, which is why today it's so important to have a kind of leadership which the people of India will believe can sail the ship of India, navigate uh, through these uh, difficult waters. So it's a weaker... A weaker a central government in India works for India's global competitors, quite clearly. I mean, who would not want to see well, us yes. outface them? Yes. Uh, uh, to put it more directly, having Narendra Modi as Prime Minister of India is not in the interests of those who may be concerned that we will be outpacing them. Uh, let me put it to you positively. I think <laughs> Am I putting it? <laughs> no, I, I put it to you this way. Having Narendra Modi as continue as the Prime Minister of India is obviously in the interest of India and the people of India, but I think is also uh, very much in the interest of friends of India and those with whom we have converging interests. Because there are a lot of countries who today, they may differ with us, yes. uh, you know, uh, I mean, we discussed some of the Western countries, but by and large, Western countries today want to see India grow. They want to see India There are these strong lobbies and, you know, did you see the Guardian article? Uh, which I, featured I an article saying I don't India's normally read the Guardian. Is there a particular article? Yeah. Are you feigning ignorance of that? No, I, I, I don't normally I read the Guardian. I don't normally yeah. read the Guardian. But, yeah. but there was an article which caught my attention, and I will. I, I'll, it's not about my views on it. I'd like your views on it. The, because the article fe which f said India's foreign intelligence agency, referring to law, RAW, allegedly began to carry out assassinations abroad as part of an emboldened approach to national security after 2019. Mm -hmm. And interestingly, on the heels of this, another American paper, the Washington Post, and if you read, says India was a miracle democracy, but it's time to downgrade its credentials. Uh, 
And, uh, you know, in February, uh, a British uh, publication said India's civil society is under attack. Uh, the crackdown is heart-rending, hurting policy-making, millions of poor Indian lives. I wouldn't be concerned about the generic comments, but I am seeking your response to the very specific charge that we are carrying out assassinations abroad and uh, quoting Indian, unnamed Indian intelligence officials, etc. Look, uh, as a generic, I mean, no, I mean, no, no, on the, on the first issue, since you cited a lot, of, yes. if a bunch of Western journalists have a problem with what is happening in India, that's their problem. Okay. okay. Have we been through that ground before? Uh, you know, I mean, I've, I've brought out to you the biases, the ideologies, the condescension. Yes. I mean, there's the, the old syndrome, yes. uh, syndrome yes. out there. So I, I say I kind of... Uh, we uh, Thank you very much. I, I know how good a democracy I am. I am today a democracy that really delivers. And if we start getting into merits of democracies and the qualities of democracies, there may be a few home truths that I may have to give, which you may not like. But let's put that aside. Mm. The second uh, The issue, uh, you know, uh, if, uh, in regard to uh, what you said, uh, I think this pertained to Pakistan. So this pertained to the alleged assassinations in Pakistan? Yeah. Oh, no. Several so, individuals, so let many, it, of no, them, many, many of them, many of them were Anna. terrorists. Something allegedly happened in Pakistan. Okay. Two people in Pakistan, presumably nationals of Pakistan, right? That's what we are talking about? Yes. Then you have the wrong end of the stick here. People should be asking Pakistan, who are these people? Who are these sterling citizens of yours who made such valuable contributions that their demise, alleged or otherwise, untimely or otherwise, is an object of international attention? So let's, let's do some, some digging out here. Who are these people? You know, why, why are their alleged deaths causing uh, concern? That should be the beginning, no? Presumably, but the question is, the charge is being put increasingly of late that India has this Mossad, Israel type no, no. approach where you enter the borders my, my, the country my country question carry out assassination. My question is still not being answered. My question is, if some, some people allegedly died in Pakistan, for whatever the causes, let's first discuss who are these people. It's well known. Many of them are terrorists. Many, Many of them are... are okay, so let, can, I, can I presume... I, we did the background information, we checked it. I mean, obviously the reference is to terrorists. Many of these terrorists are people who have played a role in carrying out terrorist okay. attacks in, in, so, on Indian soil. So these... Some of them including these taking part alleged, in... Hijackings. These alleged deaths yes. uh, in Pakistan of yes. certain people uh, are... Uh, terrorists. Are terrorists. Well, you remember that Hillary Clinton bit about snakes in your backyard. I think you have enough snakes in your backyard. Snakes may bite each other. I mean, I don't know. I mean, it's happening in Pakistan. It's for, you know, for them to figure out what is happening. But I, I would only say this. The moment I see, I see that word intelligence hmm. in any article, hmm. I can tell you what every foreign office of the world will tell you. No foreign office, no foreign minister, no foreign office spokesman ever comments on anything. The moment you see that word intelligence, we have nothing to Why say. is that? That is, because no country does that, no government does that. So, so are you saying that it has no credibility whatsoever, that particular article? I am not saying anything. I am just saying that uh, there is a, there is a, uh, I mean, a standard uh, way by which every uh, government responds to anything to do. No government responds to intelligence uh, speculation. It, it's, it's, I mean, sure, uh, let Sorry. us say if this paper had made some article about British intelligence, you think the British Foreign Secretary would be saying, oh, yes, uh, come on, guys, let me tell you everything about this? Of course not. Yes, no, but, but in an election time I'm seeing that as well as another article in the New York Times which has, says Modi is where demo, global democracy dies. On 7th of April, a British paper, the Financial Times, comments on the 2024 election being the last democratic election in the country. And you're smiling. So, okay, so w would it be that you failed to convince the Western media, despite our sterile relationships with each of these countries, on the robustness of Indian democracy? Uh, and uh, how do you read this increasing frequency of these articles on the eve of what is seen to be a historic election in India? I mean, obviously. Uh, tell me one thing. 
I mean, you and I are sitting here in India, a week away from the polls beginning. Do any of us actually feel that our electoral process, our democracy is in any danger? On the contrary, what? pick up today's newspaper. What do you see? You mm -hmm. see leader A saying this, leader B saying this, opposition party, somebody doing this deal, somebody crossing over that side. I mean, the democracy is in action. No, they may be living, I mean, they must have some view of India on some other planet. But do you I mean, see, can, can you actually, I mean, do you think any Indian actually believes today that my, our democracy is not working? Yeah, but do you not see a link between a Rahul Gandhi going abroad and saying the Western democracy should come and save us and the comments coming so much so and increasingly the State Department speaking up for them and the articles coming out. Do you not see a, a, a link between his appeal and their follow-up action? I, I do see, and I, yes, in fact, a, early on began with that. I do see a global elite which often has preferences. When their preferences are not endorsed by an electorate, they apparently get upset about it. Mm. So these things do happen. And I also do see, by the way, I do see, uh, you know, uh, politicians from India, and I, I have called it out before. Uh, you cited one example. Uh, that going abroad and inviting others to come and interfere in this country, which I believe is wrong. I, mean, I may have my differences with you, but I don't think, I mean, look at our history. What happens when people go abroad and invite people yeah. to come? Yeah. Okay. I, I think this is... This is uh, it some, encourages that trend. You feel it encourages that trend? I, I think that's, that's bad for the country. It's bad for the politics. It's bad for them, by the way. Because it shows you are so weak that you have to go outside and ask people to come and support So, so Mr. Jishanga, we referred to it some time back. Can it all get undone? Can it all come tumbling down? I mean, we're talking about an election where everybody is sort of assuming that it's going to be a sweep for the BJP. And we've gone a certain route under the Modi government on foreign policy. It's not about 24, 29. I mean, my, my question to you is we've seen what happened after the Pathan, uh, Pathan court, Balakot airstrikes. We've seen what we did with the Russian oil imports, how we took a position. But we've also seen, I mean, the word I would use is the pusillanimity of Indian foreign policy in the past. And I see this manifest, for example, in the Congress party manifesto, which says, straying from foreign policy, that the office of the National Security Council and the office of the NSA should be brought under the oversight of a select committee of parliament. So one would argue then that would the National Security Council or Mr. Doval's office, which he holds today, come under the supervision of the Danishalis and the Mahua Maitras in the future? It's a very realistic question because it's been put up as a proposition. Whereas the world is getting specialized, domain experts. So uh, I asked myself, were it not to be a straight election where we see a Modi victory, would it not be a matter of concern that the most populous country in the world would have its foreign policy turned on its head should the result be different? I think fortunately there won't be cause for concern. Oh, fortunately. Yes. So I think your worries are misplaced. This time. Uh, so, uh, no, look, I'm optimistic about our country. I, I, uh, I'm not saying we don't have challenges. But uh, since you mentioned some things, let me respond to it. First of all, uh, you know, uh, I, you must be one of the few people who's read the Congress manifesto. Uh, <laughs> you know, I, I don't know how many places... I, I read, I read, man. I have even... Yeah. I, I, but I, I compliment you on your hard work. <laughs> I would okay. even read the CPM manifesto. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so, uh, so I... But the, the fact is that uh, if you look at most countries in the world, hmm. uh, the, the national security advisor in almost any country, I can't think of any country where they actually are treated as, uh, as a, a part of a parliamentary oversight. Yes. Uh, so, so I think whoever wrote it, I mean, what can I say? You, it won't have relevance. Uh, uh, so, the, uh, I mean, in any case, I mean, I, I admire the fact that you at least bothered to read the manifesto since there will not be an occasion for anything uh, practical to happen with that manifesto. Uh, this will remain an academic point. But... There is a larger issue that you have raised, and the issue is this. You see, in the last 10 years, there have been some, uh, some significant changes in the manner in which uh, we conduct uh, foreign policy. 
not just in policies themselves. I can give you, as I said, you were, give me any major account, and I will show you that there has been change and change for the better. But uh, if you look at some core issues, which I think today uh, worry, should worry the Indian voter, okay. one core issue, you will agree, Anab, is terrorism. Yes. Okay. See, now you have to look at the change uh, in, in uh, you know, what in the last uh, decade as opposed to the previous decade. And I take you back to actually 2611. If you look, remember 2611. You, if you see people, you know, accounts of 2611, including by the NSA uh, of the previous government. You know, essentially 2611 happens, the best minds of the government apply themselves. There is, uh, you know, deep uh, uh, sort of consultation and confabulation. And then they collectively decide. What do they decide? To do nothing. So they go through this whole manthan and say, oh, by the way, the best policy is we should do nothing. What are you referring uh, to here? 2611. Hmm. Specifically, okay. was there a policy note in which they ever said that? No, that, that we will do you, you, please read um, uh, Shiv Shankar Menon's uh, account of it. You know. So my point is that if at the end of it all, because terrorism, you, you know, terrorism is not something which happened today, yesterday. Terrorism started in 1947, a few months after our independence. The first attack on Kashmir was a terrorist attack of tribal invaders on a non-deniable on a deniable basis. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Now, instead of from day one calling out terrorism, fighting terrorism, what did we eventually do? We ended up on the conference table, no? and that's how you ended up with the ceasefire line. Now, my my point is that the way to fight ter today, the people of India believe very deeply that there are some issues on which government should take a strong, uncompromising stance. Similarly, but we I can't you, take that for granted. We can't take it for we, granted. For, for sure. example, with China, we can't take it for granted. I, I agree with you on the terrorism issue, but thank you for complimenting me on reading the Congress manifesto, which also says that 370 will be brought back effectively. Hmm. And my big concern is, since the election interview, Mr. Jayashankar, is that people are concerned. Okay, there's an assumption Mr. Modi will come back, but people are concerned, what if it, that were not to be the case? I mean, what would be our relationship with China? For example, for example, I am personally, uh, I mean, we saw what happened with Manipur. And there are issues of arms smuggling on the China-Myanmar border. We know the interest that China would have in destabilizing the situation in Manipur. And, uh, you know, China openly has declared its support for the junta in Manipur, no matter how the situation changes, so they are vested. In, in Myanmar, I'm sorry, in Myanmar. So they are vested in Myanmar. They would want an entry into, uh, into India. They would want to upset the domestic situation in India. There are lobbies here that have made things difficult for a reconciliation to happen in Manipur. Can we really assume that China would not, for example, look for a moment of weakness of India's internal domestic policy uh, and Anab, politics we, to get an entry We point? must assume that life is competitive. There are powers who are, are competitive, yes. and the solution is to prepare, prepare, and prepare. Okay. I, again, I'm sorry I'm going back into history, but sometimes history is a very useful uh, teacher. Take, take today one of the crucial issues with China, which is actually uh, the line of actual control and ensuring peace and tranquility there. What is it, at the end of the day, a function of. A crucial aspect of it is actually infrastructure. You know, when our problems with China started in the 1950s, yes. it was, it's very interesting if you go back. Where did it begin? I mean, there was, of course, a reading of China between Patel and Nehru. I've spoken about in public how Patel got it right and Nehru got it wrong. Okay. Patel basically said, we have a two-front situation. Nehru said, no, 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 you know, the, the Chinese will never do anything across the Himalayas. So, uh, Nehru was trusting, Patel was applying politics 101 yeah. on a neighbor. He was just a sensible, practical, non-ideological person who made a good judgment, okay? Whereas ne Nehru made a bad judgment because he allowed his ideology to cloud 
uh, basic uh, basics of, Reading of uh, the situation. Yeah. Ba no, basics of diplomacy, yeah, yeah. which is you have a big neighbor, you have to take your precautions. Now, our first bad experience happened on an infrastructure when they built the Xinjiang Tibet uh, highway, which went through the Indian territory of Aksai Chin. Okay. From day one, it should have been in our minds that if you need to deal with China, you must build up the infrastructure. Yet, what did we actually see? I mean, I'm now between 1957-58 till 62. Okay, infrastructure was... And A.K. Anthony uh, okay. admitted it in Parliament. So, we've had actually an enormous neglect. I mean, I'm giving you, uh, you know, firm figures. I mean, if you look at the, in, the, uh, the budget for uh, development of the infrastructure along the uh, China border, it has gone up from uh, below 4, 000, about 3,500 crores to about 15,000 crores today. If you look at the quality of projects, the amount of road building going there, the tunneling which is going there, every day you will read about some project. I mean, Prime Minister recently inaugurated the Sela, uh, Sela Tunnel. So my point is this. Look, we have to assume, Arnab, that competitive powers will do things. They may or may not do it. Do not assume that they will not. So I will assume that China will. And in that context, my very specific question is, are you comfortable with the agreement signed between the Congress party? The MOU signed between the Congress party and the Chinese government, between signed by Rahul Gandhi in the presence of Sonia Gandhi in 2008 on the sidelines of the Beijing Olympics. Congress party has a side agreement with the Chinese Communist Party. How safe is that? You tell me. It's not safe, if you ask me, sir. Do you agree with me? Look. It's not safe. Uh, I, it's I, not good. I will only say this. Sir. I believe today, uh, as a foreign policy advisor to the Prime Minister, yeah. that we should have a hard-headed view of our neighbors, especially of a neighbor like China, that in that sense, the Patel tradition, sure. rather than the Nehru tradition, should guide us. You know, it's not like we, nobody wants bad relations with neighbors, but good relations cannot be built up on weakness. Good relations cannot be built up on carelessness or on ideology or on misplaced ideologies that, you know, uh, so we but, are... But if you, have a, if you have this approach government to government, would the BJP go and do an agreement with the Chinese Communist Party? Does it not compromise our national security somewhat? Does it, I mean, and the document, nobody knows what it is. I mean, is it, is it in the country's interest for the parties and government? or parties in power or opposition to have these arrangements well, with external governments? Uh, you just heard me tell you when it came so, to DMK, yes. why I believe that transparency and openness are important. Yes. I believe that as a matter of principle. You think it's the wrong. Congress should disclose that document? I, as I said, go ask them. But it's not a good thing. I think, yeah, I think more or less, I think you have, you, 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 you're making the point there. Mr. Jay Shankar, finally it is established that whenever a central force is weakened, the state is weakened. Mm -hmm. And one of the political issues which have been happening of late is the Congress saying that India is not a nation. It's been, it's been since we're in the heat of a national election, the Congress party leader goes and says India is not a nation, it's some kind of a negotiation. And you may agree or disagree with the reference, but since Brexit... No, I strongly no, disagree. With that, with that. Yeah. Yes. Would you like to respond to this view that India is not a nation? The comment made everywhere, it's a negotiation between states. It's not really a nation in that sense. Can I get your thoughts on it? I cannot believe that for any right-thinking Indian, yes. India can be a negotiation. How can it be a negotiation? I mean, this is, this is our core, core belief. It's our, it's our existence. I mean... How, how can your core identity and your core commitment... I mean, a nation is what defines people, every individual. Yes. How can that ever be a negotiation? This has been said repeatedly. repeatedly. I know, and, I'm... And, and references to India and the EU are made. Would you not think that since Brexit in 2016... No, I... I... The... Yeah, look, we, are, I, we are told that India is like Europe, you know, India should be like Europe, like the European Union. India is not like Europe, not just not like European Union, it's not like Europe on many other things. To begin with, we are a 5,000 year at least civilization. Okay. I think that alone sets us apart, but quite from the, from the you know, the, uh, the polity aspect of it, the European Union is something completely different. 
it's you know, the european union was uh, was a relatively recent construct which is treaty uh, treaty based where there were prior national identities which were much yes. you are now talking about an india yeah. which is a civilization a yeah. culture a tradition a, you know it is something which is our soul yeah uh, and if it is your soul, how can it be? I, I personally find it totally uh, appalling. So, so, but it's so, been said in. But if you so. if you are if you are a person not appreciative of our culture, if you are dismissive of our civilization, if you do not understand our heritage, then you could say such a thing. I won't. Yeah. And I frankly, I I I I found that a very. Uh, Extraordinary comment. It's a disgraceful comment. But I, again, since you're complimenting me on reading manifestos, it was part of the manifesto of the Congress which said we should move items from the concurrent list to the state list. And the attempt at sort of weakening the center. Mr. Jayashankar, we've had the issue with Canada. Where does it stand right now? I mean, where is the issue with Canada? Question one. And, uh, you know, uh, on the 21st of March, an AAP leader, Raghav Chadda, made a Brit met a British MP Preet Kaur Gill, who has advocated for Khalistani groups in London, France, Germany. We've had the Amritpal episode play out in India. We have, we have seen the Khalistani imprint on the 2020 farmers' protests. We are concerned as a nation that whatever our domestic issues are, there must be no foreign interference. And questions have been raised about whether the Ahmadmi Party allegations have been made have had links with the Khalistani forces in Canada. So comment in the current political situation on this you know, this conviviality between groups in Canada and political parties here, one. And where are we placed on the Canada issue? Uh, let me come because to the... Because they also accused us recently of interfering in their election. This was... I mean, that was a bit thick, coming from them. <laughs> uh, so, you, uh, uh, look, uh, the, the point is that uh, where are we placed vis-a-vis -vis Canada? Hmm. Uh, I think... Uh, we have had a very difficult relationship with Canada. And we've had a very difficult relationship with Canada because Canada, for political calculation, has given space to extremist uh, political forces who often advocate violence and separatism from India. Okay. These people are today allowed to operate in Canadian politics in the name of, well, what they are saying is part of free speech. Yes. Okay. Now, that's a problem for us, understandably. Yes. Yeah. And particularly if in the name of free speech you have taken it to a level of threatening diplomats of India, of any foreign country for that yes. matter, uh, of intimidating legitimate diplomatic uh, activities. Uh, and I uh, often ask my counterparts, how would you feel if the shoe was on the other foot. If this was happening to you, you'd be screaming. Yeah. So I think what it's important that that kind of space not be given, that you know this intimidation and harassment of diplomats is not uh, condoned. Yes. Uh, and that where there are uh, you know, cases, uh, I mean, after all, we are democracies, we are members of Commonwealth, you know, where there are extradition requests, where there are known terrorists uh, operating out of Canada, that these uh, requests are, are honored. So that is where we are on Canada. We have a, uh, right now a frank uh, engagement on this. I talked to my counterpart, uh, some other colleagues talked to this. Um, and I hope very much that uh, we, we have seen, uh, uh, I would say, uh, 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 cooling down of the, of a, there was a time when things had got a little heated. Uh, so I think uh, that temperature has come down. Uh, that's where things are. Uh, regarding your uh, issue parties. of, uh, of uh, no, I'll come to that, your issue of uh, From, foreign, uh, foreign interference. Yes. I think if you actually see who is interfering where, you, you, we all know, you know, which leader and in what situation who has commented on whose politics. Yes. So I, I think uh, for any country to accuse India of interfering in, in its politics, I think is, is absurd. I think in many cases, uh, if we put a mirror in front of them, I think you will get the answer. Uh, your uh, third question, uh, who is hanging out with whom yes. in London? 
you know All there is a or other relationships uh, the there is a uh, old saying that you are known by the company you keep mm -hmm. i would have thought uh, particularly at a at a sensitive time politics being what it is mm -hmm. uh, people would uh, be careful yeah if at this time you know uh, uh, you have uh, you feel that a company of known advocates of uh, Khalistan. uh, Khalistani cause is the preferred company. I think that says a lot. Yeah. You've been exceptionally candid. May I say, ask you, before I ask you the last question, I'm, uh, you've been very straightforward on a lot of things. And uh, I must say, Mr. Jayshankar, that uh, we've seen foreign ministers hold back a lot. And mm -hmm. you uh, don't hold back. Uh, you wave away some questions, but you do, you do take all of them. Mm -hmm. So I'll... My last thought to you, and this is something we want to hear from you. You have a lot of people who are your followers, Gen Next and otherwise. And uh, you know, I want you to comment on this increasing narrative of suspicion towards the 400 plus issue. The Prime Minister is going and saying, char so par, char so par, char so par. And there is a commentary which says there is a deep and sinister motive behind getting char so par because if the BJP or the BJP led coalition gets that kind of government, that kind of uh, numbers, they're going to overturn the constitution, remove democracy, uh, change the basic nature of the constitution, introduce a presidential form of government, have uh, a Hindu only government. There, are, there, is this, there is this aspect of creating a little impression, especially because the prime minister has also said, and everybody has said that fundamental, be prepared for big changes. This is only an appetizer kind of, you know, uh, statements have been made by oh. political leaders as well. But there's nothing so, sinister about that. Oh, you know how it's being read that, oh my God, big changes. What are these big changes that will be brought in the third term? Except if, Bharat. Is it just that or something? No, look, else? I mean, first of all, uh, 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 if people, it's like saying those who will not pass an exam are worrying about a student who will get distinction. And saying, oh, it will be bad if you do well, because I don't have the ability to pass the exam. So, so I think uh, people should worry about whether how they manage their own political prospects. Uh, at the end of the day, if the people of India choose to repose their confidence in the BJP on the basis of 10 years of a very, very solid record, I think uh, this should be a celebration of democracy. I don't see any reason for anxiety. And as regards, uh, as regards, uh, uh, you know, where we are going in the future. Yes. Look, look at our record of the past. Okay, because at the end of the day, past tells you something about the future. How have the mandates been used? The mandates have been used today uh, to improve the infrastructure, to grow the economy, to fight the COVID and recover from the COVID, to counter terrorism, to protect our borders. To actually restore, I'll tell you one thing, look, I am now uh, no longer uh, a young person, okay, <laughs> to put it very uh, politely. But I see today a faith in politics. I, you know, I, when I go to universities and uh, uh, meet, you know, younger uh, professionals of various categories, what has happened in the last 10 years is we have actually restored the reputation of politics in this country. That people feel a leader is someone who cares for their country. That there is a there are people who will work night and day, give their everything to take that country forward. Mm. So uh, if if people you know this is uh, sort of uh, reciprocated by a strong uh, turnout of support, whatever the number, because mm. ultimately you you know numbers we will know when the votes are counted. So I'm not going into the numbers, but to say, you know, uh, hoping for strong support is somewhere sinister. <laughs> I mean, come on. Really enjoyed talking to you. It's been a pleasure. We Thank missed you. you at the Republic Summit, but I'm glad we caught up. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Jayshankar. Enjoyed Thank it, you so Master. much. Thank, Thank you, sir. Thank you.